to the RKMS podcast. I'm Josh Keane and today's episode is going to be our business compliance and looking at basically what the companies need to look at uh, themselves to be compliant with legislation and regulations. With me today we've got Rebecca Hugoeth uh, and we've got John Keane. Okay so jumping into our first question, what does good compliance look like? Oh good compliance, well I guess you know I mean if, if you look at legislation in general uh it, it's a bit of a minefield <laughs> health and safety legislation isn't too bad uh and you normally get a bit of a warning that it's coming in into place uh environmental legislation is a different bag uh i think in the last few years apart from the covid years uh we normally introduce about 240 items of uh environmental legislation to the statutory books each year so you, it's quite easy to be caught out in terms of uh, not meeting your regulatory and statutory uh, compliance requirements mm -hmm. through through the fact of not being aware of them. But as, as you know, uh, ignorance of the law is no defence. What do we do for clients to mitigate that? What what we do is we can do a, a legal compliance audit. So we we keep abreast of uh, the latest changes in legislation. We we subscribe to a number of channels that we pay for and they tell us about updates. Uh, what we also do is, uh, as part of our ISA Smart product, we have uh, a legal compliance register uh, which lists all the legislation and then the client has the opportunity to review that or he can do it with a consultant. We can we can work together, uh, identify, is that legislation applicable to what we do? Because it might not be. So, for instance, there may be uh, environmental legislation talking about... Uh, greenhouse gas emissions, for instance, but it could be fluorinated greenhouse gases, which is uh, air conditioning. So if you don't have air conditioning in your premises, you don't need to comply with that. However, the flip side of that is you might have fridges and freezers in there, which has fluorinated gases, so you need to make sure you're aware of that as well. And there are different thresholds on the amount of gas that you've got, how you control it. Uh, and what we can do is we can actually go in and do an audit and advise the customer on that, on, on compliance. Excellent. So I suppose... Um... Another area to look at as well is maybe not so much directly legislation, but it might be health and safety, for instance, that health and safety executive have a bunch of guidelines that obviously there's, there's legislation, obviously, which is around health and safety, um, but it's how do you apply that in certain areas of your business? So like fire risk assessments, for instance, now every company has to have a fire risk assessment documented. It used to be five or more, if you employ five or more people, whereas the, this year the legislation changed to basically say you have to have it now. Every business, no matter your size. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the, the the law did change in, in October 23, uh, and it basically said, said from then on that uh, the responsible person for a building, for instance, even if it's uh, if you've only got two employees, you need to have a documented fire risk assessment. You need to look at what the, the risks are in that building of, of the fire occurring, but not only that, the means of escape and evacuation, uh, that is safe enough. But also if you're <clears throat> a building within a building, for instance, so say you're hiring, uh, you're renting, should I say, a room in the back of an office block, you've got to cooperate with everybody else to get out of that building. So it's no good if you go through a room through a room to get into your office. If somebody locks the door and you can't escape, you, you you have to cooperate with them and be able to, 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 to escape through there. Uh, other things, for instance, you, you're quite right. It used to be a certain number of people. However, it is, it's it's one person now in a building. If you're responsible for that building, then you need to have a fire risk assessment. It needs to be documented and it needs to be done by a competent person as well. So you can't just say, you know, maybe it's the cleaner. Cleaner came in and did the fire risk assessment. It's got to be somebody who's got a level of, of uh competence to do that fire risk assessment and that again would depend on the nature and scale of operations in the building uh it could be something quite simple like an online fire risk assessment uh training course for somebody if they're just looking at one office space if you will uh but if you're if you've if you've got a, a large a factory or, or a skyscraper yeah with loads of different routes of uh, methods of escape loads of different routes loads of different uh things that can interact and cause a fire then you need to do somebody who's got a bit more a uh, bit more of a, a competence in fire risk assessment so if you was a new business or maybe not so much a new business it could be an established one uh what would you say are the key things to look at in terms of compliance and, and how do we fit into that like how can we support yeah i mean you've got there's obviously business legislation as well uh 
so you need to sort of like you know register with company's house and things like that as the VAT side of things and, and what have you we we don't tend to uh, specialize or work with that legislation we we tend to look at sort of health and safety uh, requirements so for instance we would go into a company and, and look at how many staff we've got the nature of what we do and we'd look at say uh, what the requirements are for first aid if you look on the HSE uh, website it does give you guidance and so for a very simple operation where there's not much of a risk say an office for instance you, you might only need one appointed person per 50 members of staff uh, however if you're working in a higher risk industry like construction or manufacturing engineering or something like that uh, then you might want to look at the number of staff that you've got to give cover now it does state that it's a minimum of that person it's one person per so many people but what you've got to take into account as well is yeah that one person it has to be more because what if you're working shifts mm -hmm. you've got three shifts working three shift pounds you need one person on each shift sickness, yeah. sickness, sickness and sickness. Yeah. yeah so that requirement that it says you need to say maybe one trained first aider if you're working a three shift pattern it, it would automatically become say six trained first aiders and that's what you've got to be aware of and that's where it, you can get tripped up with the legislation yeah and that, that, that the guy that's also tells you because obviously there's there's different levels of first aid training so you've got your awareness basic first aid you've got your emergency first aid at work and you've got your full-blown first aid at work that guide is, tells you as well what they recommend which level and which, depth. which yeah depending on risk and again numbers of staff it, and obviously you'd have to take into consideration like say again shift patterns yeah as well yeah so just touching on sort of your fire assessments that you you mentioned mm -hmm. when it comes to sort of building blocks apartments who is overall responsible for Sort of the safety and well-being of people and for the, the fact that these fire systems need to be carried out is it the landlord is it the company owner is it the yeah that, that that kind of depends a little bit if it's a, a domestic building the landlord has responsibility for the communal areas there is no requirement in theory for doing a fire risk assessment in a domestic building however it would be good practice particularly after you look at the grenfell disaster mm -hmm. that we, we do need to look at that. We need to look at the uh, the, the method of escape, the, the, the way that we control and contain fire and the information and guidance that we give to residents if in a case like that where there's a fire, because obviously that was a, a terrible uh, tragedy and uh, a disaster. Uh, when it comes to commercial buildings, if you're in, say, I think, I think, was you alluding to like being in a serviced office, for instance? Yeah. Yeah. So if you're in a serviced office, as an employer, you have a responsibility, you have a duty of care to make sure that your employees are safe. And that does include fire uh, assessment and fire evacuation procedures. Ultimately, if you're in a serviced office, it will be up to the landlord to make sure things like the fire alarms are checked, the emergency lines checked, that the escape routes are, are adequate, that they probably provide fire extinguishers. However, if they don't, as an employer, you've got a duty of care to make sure that that happens. So it may be that you buy your own uh, fire extinguishers and have them serviced separately to, to the rest of the building, for instance. Mind that be in the contract that you signed, your lease agreement? Yes. And it's responsible for servicing yeah. and maintaining it. Yeah. yeah. There is what's known as a maintaining, uh, fully maintaining lease or, or a lease that the, the landlord's responsible for that sort of thing. Uh, am I right? I think as well, the landlords are responsible for communal areas. So like corridors, foyers. Yeah, in both commercial and domestic yeah. buildings, yeah. So HSE have got guidelines which tell us, or well, tell anybody, what they're sort of after in terms of levels of risk when it comes to first aid training. Could you elaborate a bit more onto that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's not always as clear cut as, as, as you think because what the HSC will say is that if you're a low risk and then you've got to be, you're responsible for defining what is low mm -hmm. risk. It does give you some examples. But say you're an office uh, that people are on the ground floor, they work in there, they go in there, they're working on a desk and then they leave. Uh, they might go out for lunch. So in terms of first day, it's minimal. The Sorry, the, in terms of the risk, it's minimal. So therefore, it may be just simply having an appointed person. So an appointed person is a person that has the responsibility of ringing an ambulance and coordinating the emergency services if somebody becomes ill. The next stage from that really would be an emergency first aider, uh, which is emergency first aider work, which is a one day course. And it does do that. It's emergency basic life support. It's basic information. Again, you, you know, the, the first aider would be the person that normally completes the accident report and stuff. If the business is a little bit more complicated, uh, say it's, it's a higher risk business, it might be in construction or manufacturing engineering or something like that, 
then what you need to do then is probably do the, uh, it used to be a three-day course, which is the uh, first day to work course. We actually deliver that as a two-day blended, well, it's a three-day blended learning course where you do some work off-site, you, you fill in a, a, a bit of information, it asks you about certain things, you do a bit of learning, and then it's a two-day on-site, uh, first day that it covers using uh, an AED defibrillator uh, and basic life support things. Uh, that changes all the time depending on what the HSE guidance is. But basically, you've got your, your appointed person, emergency first aider, and then you've got your first aider work person who's qualified to that higher level, if you will. There is potentially a further higher level than that. Uh, for instance, we used to deliver uh, first first aid response training to the United Arab Emirates military. Uh, the firefighters of the Air Force were taught first aid, and we actually did a satellite operation out there where we taught, I think we did about, 80 firefighters where we train them and what that is that's a four-day course and the fourth day is basically unique to the uh, the environmental conditions of our business so for instance uh in that case we would be looking at the fourth day would be about how do you treat severe trauma because it'd be it'd be it'd be a war mm -hmm. it'd be a, a battle a theater if you will so you'd be looking at uh serious traumas you'd be looking at burns you'd be looking at ampute, ampute, amputations stuff like that you know massive blood loss how do you deal with that and that's what that that's for uh to put that into say you're a chemical manufacturer then you'd expect that fourth day or the level the higher level should i say would be unique to what you're actually doing so if it's a, a chemical company you'd be looking at uh, potential for burns eye injuries and things like that uh and you would tailor your first aid delivery around that because that's what the, the you know the major risks are is there um is there any other sort of training that is mandated or essential for businesses uh, just first aid yeah i mean if, if you lift the equipment for instance if you're using ladders then they should be inspected every six months uh so it means that you, you know somebody's competent needs to do that and that can be done in-house uh there are plenty of health and safety guidance documents that show you how you to inspect a ladder so you could do that in-house but then you get things like uh using uh mobile equipment so say maybe fall lift truck there's a requirement to have competence in there. So you'd say every three years you send somebody to do a first aid. Uh, sorry, first aid. <laughs> you get your you get your trucker to do a first aid. <laughs> uh, yeah. So there are various things like say, for instance, uh, mobile elevated platforms or scissor lifts or mupes. You have to have a uh, you have to have a license to operate them. So that training's a requirement. Uh, obviously, that's not sort of the training that we offer, but there are approved centres that deliver that training. Uh, forklift training as well. You know, there's a, there's a requirement that the, the guys driving forklifts are competent, and that's normally on a, a forklift truck licence, as it's called. And it's every three years that we get refresher training on it. Okay, as the slogan says, we are a one-stop shop for compliance. How do sort of ISO standards tie in and all the other offerings that, offerings that, that RKMS offer? Well, I mean, the way that ties in is with quality management, You've got contract law. You've got how you operate professionally. Environmental management, 14,001. Basically, you have to comply with legislation. If you're not complying with legislation, and this is where, again, we go back to the, the competence of the auditor. Uh, if somebody's coming to audit you in your industry sector, then they should have knowledge of our industry sector, so should know what type of legislation you know you have to comply with. And for instance, environment, if you're, if you're cleaning, believe it or not, if you're cleaning one vehicle with a jet wash, by law, you should have a consent to discharge license from the, the local water authority because that is trade effluent. This, this water has been generated through a trade process that's going down the drains. And they'll come along, you have to comply with that. Uh, if you're not, you're open to prosecution. And that's something that not a lot of people are aware of. Uh, when it comes to 45,001 health and safety, again, you need to know what health and safety legislation is applicable to your business. And that helps you make sure that you know, you, you, you're identified by legislation, how it applies to you, and that you're complying with it as well. So it, it kind of keeps you safe from prosecution to an extent. Uh, we've got one client, actually, who they've just gone through 9, 14, 45, and 27. And yes, it's a large organization, and they work in, in a relatively high-risk, perceived high-risk industry. They've just received an €80,000 reduction per year on their insurance premiums because of having them standards. Wow. So, so the way I sort of see it as well is, is I, the big sort of foundation of ISO is continual improvement. Yes. Well, that's effective what lean management is as well. Yeah. Continual improvement. Yeah. In a way. Mm -hmm. um, so they sort of complement each other. With, with ISO, you've got, what, what, well, in our systems anyway, we call them improvement reports. 
yeah. or improvement register. And part of that is we're looking, and the ISO requires you to do this, is look at root causes. So it's root cause analysis. What container yeah. action can you put in place and how can you improve upon that mm -hmm. and make sure it doesn't happen again? A lot of the tools that you use during that process are lean tools. Yes. So that's where it kind of, obviously, there's, there's a bit of synergy there. Um, and the way that we operate as well is, like I say, we, we offer value. So the way that we operate is... We do stuff that's, that is takes compliance, mm -hmm. but we do it in a way that me, and benefits your business as such. Yeah. Um, and it's looking at that continuous improvement and we give you those tools and techniques as well to be able to use those when we're not there. Um, and then obviously with trading as well, that ties in this requirements of, of standards that you have to have um, trading competency. So it's effectively yeah. making sure that your staff have got the adequate training or qualifications. Mm -hmm. Um, and then obviously the legislation side of things as well we were mm -hmm. sort of talking about earlier with health and safety first aid so probably is where a lot of our so I mean, most of the time when we sort of when we go to like networking events or whatever yeah. and we say well what do you do and we stand there for the 10 minutes talking about all the different offerings that we have and yeah. people just think why do you do so much <laughs> right. well that's the reason <laughs> why and a lot of it yeah well. integrates so it might be they're all they are their own areas in on their own mm -hmm. but they feed into one another yeah, yeah it, it, it's, it's a tricky one because you've got a lot of consultants that will specialise in quality management but won't touch health and safety. You've got consultants that will specialise in lean management but won't touch quality management. Uh, and, and what we tend to do is we, we have a one-stop compliance. Where that comes from, in a way, is that we can look at the way that you operate, we can look at the way you can make improvements to the business. And as you say, with, with 9001, a lot of 9001 consultants don't really understand lean and a lot of lean consultants don't understand 9001. It's really, it's a framework uh, yeah. to stand by as what you do. So you, you're dead right there. Like with uh, continuous improvement, for instance, something goes wrong. Nobody's perfect. You know, we all we all make mistakes from time to time. But it's about learning from that mistake, uh, finding out what caused it, and which is the root cause analysis. It's a bit like you're driving down the road and you got your, you know, your five-year-old grand, grandchild, in our case, or your own son mm -hmm. in the back of the car. And they ask you a question and you tell them, and then they say, but why? And then you tell them something else, and then... But then it's why, isn't it? So there's a, there's a technique called the five whys, for instance. And, uh, and basically, by the time it comes to the fifth why, you either tell them the truth or you tell them to shut up. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's basically, it's a way of getting that out of you. Yeah. Uh, Persistence. Yeah, things like, uh, some of the other things that you've got here, like uh, you're looking at five SODs, which is workplace organisation. Pokey okey, it's not poking an egg. What that is, it, it, it's a Japanese term. It means error-proofing. So, for instance, the best error-proofing uh, analogy you've got is uh, years ago, people used to write letters and then they'd type envelopes and they could mix them up. Uh, you know, you've got envelopes now with a window in them, haven't you? So it's irrelevant. you got your address on your letter. It cannot go to the wrong person now. It's, it, it, you've, you've completely removed the, the chance of error from, from happening. So that's a great idea of a pokey -okey. But you can do that every day in business as well. Different sort of keys to use different tools means that you can't use the wrong tool. You can't make a mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's about that level of, uh, of managing your business, making sure that you take away the, uh, the 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 option the opportunity for for errors to happen, and that's how it kind of all ties together. Yeah, I suppose it is. There's areas that we might identify when we're in a business that we can't support with. Do we have any additional support? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, sometimes we get asked. Uh, I mean, we, we, we one stop for compliance. We cannot be experts in everything. You know, we've got a, a large pool of guys that we work with, people we work with, and we've got associate partners that we work with as well. So, for instance, if it's HR, we are not HR experts, but we know HR experts. And what we'll do is we've got agreements in place with these HR people that we know we vetted them. We know how good they are because they've worked with other people. We will only recommend people that we know are good and we've vetted already as part of our onboarding process. So, yeah, we, we can get that. We've had uh, instances in the past where we've had, you know, specialist things like, you say, HR uh, there's been maybe uh, contract uh, issues where we've, we've sent in people we know to help the, the clients out. Uh, other things that have been a little bit more specialist. Uh, I'm just trying to think of some of, some of the examples we've done over the years. Uh, we've helped people uh, with product certification, for instance. Uh, they've been asked for a, uh, a product declaration or environmental product declaration. Uh, we were a company years ago that invented a... Uh, a plastic that had a biocide and it that killed MRSA, for instance. And we, we helped them achieve getting that product CE marked, uh, but we had to go out and use experts that we knew of that could do sort of fire resistance testing. We could do all the sampling, uh, things like that. 
So yeah, we 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 like to say we're a one stop shop because we want clients to come to us and ask us uh, for advice and guidance. And if we can do it, we can always find somebody that can.